I sent out a, a list of 10 things. You know, they remember on the TV when they used to do the top 10? Well, I don't know if these are the top 10, but these are 10 things that I, I wanted for us as a church family to focus on here during October as we move into November and December, the election coming up and all that. And so I listed 10 things. And this past week, uh, we were focusing on the first four, uh, pray for our nation, that our nation would honor God and his word, pray for our leaders, our president, Congress, upcoming election, pray that our hearts would pursue uh, after righteousness and not sin, pray for uh, no division, for, for unity. This week, the next three that I want us to focus on uh, in our prayer time uh, together as a congregation or in your quiet time or just praying together about it is uh, number five is that evil, that evil would be exposed and be cast out. And then the sixth one is the protection of our children. Um, the protection of our children. Uh, not just uh, physically against the, the uh, pandemic and uh, those that are in school, of course, where we live up in Memphis, they're not, the kids aren't in school uh, and in other places. But, but pray for the protection of our children. Uh, the children are the future of our nation. And uh, I, they're being bombarded. They're, they're actually being um, <laughs> targeted, <laughs> our kids. Um, human trafficking, of all things. Um, pray for the protection of our children. Of course, most of us have grandchildren, so I'm, 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 I'm widening that for our children and our grandchildren. And then the, 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 other, the third thing for, for this week is, is just God's protection. Uh, I don't know about where you live. Uh, I live in, in what they say. I, I've talked to the police that our community there in Cordova is uh, one of the, I guess it's relative, <laughs> Brother Whalen, uh, one of the safer uh, areas, but... Uh, uh, I told Connie I'm glad she went to bed early and didn't hear it, but last night, about right at about 10 o'clock, pow, 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 pow. Uh, I don't know, it was close, I don't know where it was, it was south of where we live, but um, gun, gunshots. And uh, I thought this morning in our neighborhood on the little thing that we, we would see it, but I, I have some neighbors, they'll, they'll probably tell me what, what happened. But for God's protection, not so much just that, the violence and all the stuff that's going on, but we need the hand of God uh, over our nation and over our churches and, uh, and cer certainly our, our, our first responders, our police officers and, and um, firemen and, and, and all of those first responders and, and over these doctors and nurses that are laying their lives on the line, going in and treat, treating... Uh, uh, most of us have someone, I have a, a niece and a nephew up in St. Louis. He's a doctor and she's a nurse. Um, God's protection. So, so that's just a, a thing that I wanted us to be praying about together as a church family. Born again to love. That's the message today. You know, our, our culture has taken some uh, biblical words... And our culture has, has redefined and cheapened, I believe, uh, them so that they no longer mean what the Bible intended them to mean. Uh, one of them is born again. <laughs> Let's all say that. that. Born again. You know. Born again. Uh, the media uh, uses this to describe anyone who makes some kind of a comeback or gets a fresh start. You know, they, they talk about sports teams. They've been born again, <laughs> you know. Or, or a, a car company, remember Iacocca and Chrysler, uh, the company was, was born again, use that term. Uh, Barna, George Barna, the, the, the Christian uh, uh, researcher, says that over 50% of Americans say that they have been, quote, born again. Born again. And it may have involved praying to Jesus and, and turning from their sins and trusting in Him and, and uh, really being born again, but, but I believe in many cases uh, they have no idea what the Bible means about being born again. And then there's this other word. You know, in the Bible, I mean, in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, there's three words. In English, we only have one word, and it's the word L-O-V-E. Um, love. We... we, we, we we say, you know, I love pizza. When we were coming to church this morning, 
there in Germantown, there's a big sign of it. I love Germantown. Oh, of course, there's, you've seen the ones with the white and the red heart. I love New York. Um, but what does it mean? What, what does L-O-V-E uh, mean? Uh, I'm bringing up these two uh, terms because they are central to the understanding of the passage that we're looking at uh, this morning. If we allow, if we allow our culture's uh, devalued definitions of these words to affect the way that we think about them, we will miss what God is saying to us this morning. We have to keep in mind the biblical definition of these words, and we need to reject our culture's definition of them. You know, in the Bible, the word that's most often used for love is the word agape. And uh, that word is speaking about God's kind of love. It's self-sacrificial love. It's a love, really, that only God can produce. And we're going to see that. You can't, you can't muster it up, folks. It can't be humanly done. But it's the, love, it's the love that Jesus demonstrated when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But you remember where these, these scattered believers that, that Peter was writing this letter to were made up of both Jews and Gentiles. That was a radical, in that day, that was a, a, a radical cultural mix in that day. And, and they were being persecuted for their faith. You know, I, suffering and difficulty, we all know this, turns sometimes small irritations into conflict in our relationships. And sometimes it triggers friction that otherwise not might, might not exist. But when trouble comes, when, when suffering comes, when difficulty comes, if we're not careful, just little bitty things, I'm talking about little bitty things, become blown out of portion. And that's what we see here. Now, after learning that, that Christ followers should have a holy lifestyle, we learn uh, this morning that the new birth demands a new kind of love. If we're followers of Christ, we're, demand, we're commanded here <laughs> with a new kind of love. New birth brings new love. Let's say that. New birth brings new love. That's what it says. That's what we're learning today in the family of God. Christ followers must love because they have been born again through God's imperishable word. And as we saw last week, we are to be holy. That simply means that uh, we're, to, to, we're to reflect who God is. That's what it means being set apart. That's the word we, I mean, we don't use that word a lot now. When I preach like holiness, most of them probably never heard a sermon preached on holiness. But, but that's what it means to be holy. And we learn that because our Heavenly Father is, is, is holy, and we're to be holy, and He's our judge, and we've been redeemed, we've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and now we see that the kind of holiness uh, that stems from the new being born again has to work itself out in love of our fellow uh, believers. That's what He's talking about here. So I, I want us to look this morning first at two aspects of the new birth, what it means to be born again, and then we're going to look at this new love that has to follow from that. So first of all, notice with me this morning that the new birth, being born again, truly born again by the Spirit of God, is marked by purity of soul in obedience to the truth. Notice he says, since, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this, this tells you and me that when you were converted, when you trusted in Jesus Christ, you're saying, a, when we're converted, a person begins a new life of obedience to the truth of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. And the outward symbol of that, of course, is baptism. Uh, it pictures the inward cleansing from sin that takes place in a person who puts their trust in Jesus Christ. But let me... Let me be clear about two things. Baptism does not save anyone. Folks, you can go through that water up there and be baptized a hundred times. <laughs> it won't save you. You see, baptism is a picture of what's already happened on the inside. It is important. The Bible says, actually, we're commanded to be baptized. 
If, if a person says they're a Christian following Christ and they haven't been baptized, they, they're disobedient. The Bible says we're to, we're to be baptized. But baptism doesn't save us. Personal faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross saves a person from God's wrath and judgment. Amen? Amen. But baptism is a way that a person who's trusted Christ confesses Jesus publicly. Uh, it's an outward expression of the obedience to Christ that flex, reflects an inward reality of saving faith in Him. Of course, you all know I'm a missionary. And you can take a missionary off the foreign field and it doesn't change you. But let me ask you this morning, in many parts of the world, where Connie and I live for more than 30 years, um, let me ask you, would you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ if you knew that that meant that you would be publicly beaten or in many cases put to death? Because that's the way it is in many parts of the world. Or, or a little bit lesser, where we were in, in the Philippines, be disinherited. Lose all your inheritance. Your family just totally reject you. Well, there's no such thing as saving faith apart from obedient faith, folks. Notice that, that's what he's saying here. Uh, please listen to me carefully this, this morning. There is no such distinction in the Bible between faith and obedience. Whoa. Brother Sam. Christ followers are those, it says, it says it right here, since you, you they purified their souls, what? in obedience to the truth. Listen to Rom Romans 1, 5 says that they preach the gospel to bring about the obedience of faith among the disciples, uh, among the uh, Gentiles. Through him we have received grace and apostleship by obedience to the faith among all nations in his name, Paul says in uh, Romans 1, 5. Romans 10, 16 says something very similar. It says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. It didn't say believed. It says they have not all obeyed. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Belief in faith. A belief in obedience. Um, believing and obeying are used interchangeably in the Bible so many times. Uh, listen to 2 Thessalonians 1.8. Jesus is coming back. Amen? We've been, we looked at that in Thessalonians, and it's in here in 1 Peter too. But it says, when he comes back in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not what? Obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and obedience in the Bible are the same. Uh, John 3.36 says this, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see... There is a connection between belief and obedience. Now, does that mean that a true uh, Christ follower never disobeys God? Of course not. <laughs> we're, uh, we're sinners saved by grace. And uh, our sin nature is not totally eradicated, except when we get to heaven. But it does mean, this does mean that there's no such thing as a characteristically disobedient Christ follower. If a person claims to be born again, to be saved, but lives a chronic uh, life of disobedience to God and disregard for the Word of God, that person is deceived, folks. <laughs> they, have self -de they have deceived themselves. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. And it goes on and on and lists all this. It's talking about people that don't obey. There is... Listen to Galatians 6, 7. I think it's up here. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he'll also reap. And 1 John 3, 4, 3 7 says this. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is right. Uh, 
Saving faith is marked out by, by purification of the inner person and obedience to God's truth. And part of that obedience, as we're going to see, is loving the brethren. How we love one another. How we treat one another. How we love one another. And so, first of all, we've learned that the new birth is marked out by being purified on the inside through the truth of God, through the word of truth. But the second thing we learn is that, that being born again, the new birth takes place through God's imperishable word, this word of God here. Look at it. Since you have been born again, having been born again, verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. You see, the idea here is that the new birth, which takes place through, the, through God's eternal word, brings us into a new eternal family where God is our father. The only people who can really call God their father are followers of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? We, we, we become part of a new eternal family. And, and, and God here in his word through Peter shares two, two facets of the new birth. The new birth is, comes about, is affected by God's word, not by man. Not by man. It is God who saves. And he does it through the word. He does it both by, through the, the preached word, through the written word. Uh, listen to James 1.18. James 1.18 says this. It says, of his own will. He's talking about God's will, not our will. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creation. You see, the only way that we can know God is through the revelation, through, through, through the revelation that he's given us about who he is. And he's chosen uh, uh, to make a record of it, uh, that, that revelation. And it's in the Bible. This is it right here. This is it. And wherever the Bible, folks, has gone, and the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ that's recorded in the Bible, wherever that's been preached, the miracle of new birth takes place. I remember the first time <laughs> that I shared the gospel up in Lake Cebu in the southern Philippines. Up in this beautiful mountain area, beautiful lake called Lake Cebu. I'd studied the language for eight months and I was about ready to give up. <laughs> but the Lord gave me an opportunity to go visit the place where we were going to live. Because in language study, we lived in a different place. And I remember sharing the gospel, folks, and almost everybody there trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because they were wait they had not heard the good news. They had not heard it. They, only, they lived in fear. They, lived, they, they, they believed that uh, God was a bunch of uh, spirits that lived in the forest and in the trees. And, and God was the owner of all this stuff, but, but uh, they lived in fear. They, they offered uh, animal, uh, they would kill chickens and stuff. And, but when they heard the good news of Jesus Christ, they were born again. And now that tribe, by the way, not because of anything we did really, but that tribe now is almost 40 or 50 percent Christian. And they, they, they're sending folks into other places to share the gospel. Uh, the new birth, when it happens, when the, God uses the word, God uses the gospel. And the second thing we learn about the new, new birth here is that it's lasting. It's not temporary. It, it comes from the imperishable seed as contrasted to the perishable human seed in which all of us were born in this world. The imperishable, imperishable seed is the word of God, the Bible says, that lives and abides forever. So this new life that God imparts through his word is eternal. It is not subject to death. That's why I say at funerals, you know, Christ followers don't die. Jesus said it. He said, I'm the resurrection of life. He who lives, lives and believes in me shall never die. He said. Now, this physical body will, will give way. But we're going to live forever with the Lord. We, we've been saved by this imperishable seed. But notice the contrast here. He's quoting from uh, Psalm 103 and also Isaiah 40. He goes on to say that, that we, were not, we were born again not by corruptible seed, by incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever because all flesh 
is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. What's he saying here? Everything, folks. Let me remind you. You know that beautiful house you live in? <laughs> you know all the <this> stuff <laughs> that we spend all of our time? You see that you, you, it's starting to happen out there. Some of it's still a little green. Look at, look at the grass. Mine's still living. I'm be glad when it finally dies. <laughs> I don't have to go mow the grass anymore. But uh, all of this stuff, it's going to fade away, folks. That's what he's saying here. He's making a contrast here. <laughs> and uh, it, it'll fade away like flowers. But God's word will stand forever. And when you are suffering, when we're suffering in this alien world, we're strangers living in this. This world is not our home, folks. That song is so correct. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. <laughs> our home's in heaven. We're, our citizenship is in heaven, folks. We're followers of the Lord. And this is just a, a probationary period of whatever, how many years the Lord lets us live here. But when we're suffering in this alien, and we look around, and and, and we, and, and it looks. It, I mean, especially some of these cars. And, and, and uh, I, I went to places, some of these houses. I mean, it, it looked glamorous. It, it seems like it's going to last forever. But, but don't be fooled, folks. It's going to be gone. Whatever man has done and made is going to be gone. Don't be fooled. It will fade. It will perish. But the new birth that you possess through the Lord Jesus Christ, through God's Word, it will last forever. And it's on the basis of that that we come to the main <laughs> point. That's all about born again there with the new birth. But he says, because you've been born again, what does he say? We're to love one another. And he uses that word agape. The new birth demands new love. Let's say that again. Say it with me. The new birth demands what? New love. The new birth demands new love, folks. There were, they were suffering. They were being persecuted as aliens in a foreign world. You know, if you were, and I've experienced this, if you were American living in a strange country and you were being hounded because you were an American and you heard that close by you there was another American also in that same place, I guarantee you, you'd seek them out, wouldn't you? Because uh, you would cling to them because you knew they understood what you were going through. Well, folks, that's like us. Uh, those who are members of God's family through new birth in Jesus Christ need to stick together in this foreign alien world that we live in that is so against us. And folks, <laughs> hold on to your seats. You think that we're beginning to lose some of our freedoms or being targeted as Christians in this country? Just, just hold on to your seats. This new love is necessary. It is a necessary result of the new birth. But folks, what I want to say to you this morning, this is, this is the crux of everything. So if you haven't been listening, listen right now. This kind of love, it's not automatic. <laughs> it is not. It, ha it has to be commanded, which, and it has to be nurtured. You, you have to exert yourself to do it. And it says we're to, we're to love fervently from our hearts. Listen to 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, 9 and 10 we, that we've already looked at. But it says, but, con but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you what? Increase more and more. You're, he said, yeah, you, you're loving one, but, but, but do more. Increase more. Increase your love. You know, biblical love is, is a, a self-sacrificing, caring commitment that shows itself in seeking the highest good of the one that you're loving. It is not sentimental. Love, I'm not talking about Hollywood love, folks. Uh, love, biblical love, real love, is not, 
the, comor, the, the core of love is a commitment, folks. It's, it's commitment. It, it doesn't mean uh, also always being nice, by the way. <laughs> uh, sometimes commitment uh, to seek a person's highest good involves confronting them in some way that causes stress and pain sometimes. Amen? If you're, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about, folks. <laughs> uh, I've, been, I've been married for going on 48 years. It's tough. It's tough. It's not easy. That's why I say it's not automatic. But, but re love is always caring, even when it, it has to confront. And, it, and it's not devoid of feelings or compassion or tender, tenderness. It, 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 it usually involves some kind of sacrifice on the part of the person that's, that's giving it or extending it. The, the highest good of anyone, folks, is that he or she comes under the lordship of Jesus Christ so that his life will ultimately, now and ultimately, bring glory to God. And so this love is described here. Notice how he describes it. He, three, three ways here. First, he says sincere. It's to be a sincere love. Notice what he says. In first uh, 22, last part. In sincere love of the brethren. What does that mean? What is sincere? Uh, biblical love is not affirming and, and gushy to a person's face, but then disparaging when they're gone. <laughs> it, it's not manipulative. You know, trying to butter the person up for one's own advantage while your heart's really not right. Biblical love doesn't try to use someone for your own personal gain. It's sincere. And then he says it's clean. Notice the second one. Fervently love one another from a clean heart. You see, love is not impure. It, it has to stem from a clean heart, the Bible says. And then finally, notice he uses this word fervent. Uh, lo love one another with a fervently. Uh, that means to, the, the word there fervent literally means to stretch out. It, it literally means to strain. That's love, strain to love one another. That's the kind of love. It implies effort. It implies emotion. It's, it's like, a, a beautiful illustration is in Luke twenty two forty four, when Jesus is there in the Garden of Gethsemane on his knees crying out to the Father. And he said, Lord, if, if there's any other way. You see, he was human. Jesus, except for sin, he never sinned. But he was, I mean, you cut him, he bled. We know that from the cross. He was human. And so there he is. He, he's pouring out his soul to God. He says, if, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But not as I will, but as your will. This is what I got to do to save mankind. I'll, I'll do it, but I don't. I, he struggled. And it says he, he sweat. Uh, his sweat was like blood. Folks, that's the perfect illustration of fervent love. It's also illustrated, you remember when Peter was in prison? And it says the church prayed fervently when he was, he's about to be executed. And the church prayed. Love is more than an emotion. It is, it has, it has emotion, but it's a whole lot more than that. Uh, agape, it can, be, it can be commanded and it involves our will. It involves hard work. It involves effort. It is not always easy, but it is required as a cru crucial outworking of the new birth. If you are born again, you have to do it. That's what it is. That's what it says here. It has to work itself out. Well, I got to bring... It's gone longer than I wanted to go, but... As we think about responding to this message this morning time of invitation in just a moment let me just say we must be engaged in eternal things not earthly things because that's what it's like, they're like the grass brother David it's all going to we must be involved we must be engaged in eternal things not earthly things parents and grandparents focus on eternal things with your children and your grandchildren because that's what's going to last focus on that uh, 
He tells us that, that these will be the things that have to do with the Word of God because it's imperishable and it lasts forever. Teach your children and your, and your grandchildren the things that matter, the things that will endure forever. And as a church, church, temple, Temple Baptist Church, let me say this, this morning to you as, as a church, we must avoid flashy uh, programs and the latest fads and all this stuff, all the periphery. You see, so many, so many of our churches there, I, sad to say, it breaks my heart. Boy, they're, they're appealing in some ways. But that's not, the, the church, we must commit ourselves. <laughs> you see, these things are grass and flowers. The, the, the grass and flowers of human um, effort. If we are to be a biblical church, we must preach and teach the word of God. <laughs> that, is, that is all we are about. We must be diligent. We must be perf purposeful as we steer clear of the grass and the flowers. And, and we must look to the unfading eternal word of God. So let me just close by asking you a few questions this morning. And I know they may sound pointed, but I think we all need to hear them. Um, have you been born again? I'm have you truly been born again? Do you have a new nature? Yeah, you have the old nature, but has, has the Holy, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone and what he's doing? How, you say, well, how can I be sure? Well, there's several tests in the Bible. Do you obey God's word? When you hear the word of God, do you seek to obey it? Not that you're going to obey it 100% of the time. But is that the bent of your heart? You see, it's not that, we've never, that you never sin, but it, it's the desire, the bent of your life to please the Lord, to love Him, the one who gave Himself for you. It, you know, it is impossible for us to love others as God wants us to if we've not been born again. So when you see all of this crime and all this stuff going on, folks, that should not shock us. I know it does. But people who do not know God cannot love. They have not been born again. They have not been changed. So we, we should not expect them to. That's why it's so important that we need to share the gospel. We should live out our faith. So today, put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, Savior and Lord. But here's the biggie. Here's the biggie that I want to leave with you to respond to this morning. The question. Are you working? Are you working at loving as you should? God's Word says here that if, if we have been born again, we must work at having a sincere, a clean, a fervent love, especially toward Christ followers, others who are a part of the family of God. And you may need to begin at home. I don't know. Or with some extended family member. It may be someone in this church that you're, you don't love like you ought to. If you have received the new birth, you've got to work at new love. New, what did I say? New birth, let's say it again. New birth demands new love. New birth demands new love. If you've been born again, you must love. As Christ, as we love him because he first loved us. When our girls were growing up, our daughters, we used to sing scripture songs. And one of them was uh, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. That's it, folks. We are demanded, we are commanded we must make sure that what we do in this life has eternal results. We can do a lot of good things, even great things. We can be very busy, but are the things that we're spending our time on doing, are they like grass? Are they like the flowers? Or 
are they enduring? And even if we do something great, it may look like a flower, and it will fade away. Let's stand. Lord, we stand here today before you. I do as a preacher, as a follower of you, as one of your children, searched through and through. May we all pray that prayer of the psalmist. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, if there's anybody here, Lord, if there's anybody here who's not sure of their salvation, I pray that today they will come to that point where they know and they know and they know of certainty that they are, have been born again. And if they've not been born again, may they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then for those of us, Lord, who know you today, what, may we recommit ourselves to that love that you've commanded us and help us to respond as only you would want us to. I pray in Jesus' name.